Okay, let's uh, open with prayer. Father, uh, we ask special blessings on some folks who are uh, part of our congregation not here today um, in the hospital, blood clots. Uh, and we ask uh, prayers for those who are in travel. Uh, Harold and uh, Don and Kate. Mary Ann. Uh, please be with us this morning as we uh, study your word, open our hearts to the message that you would have us receive. In thy name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, um, no matter where Jesus is and what he's doing and saying, his eyes have always been on Jerusalem and his impending destiny. And uh, until now, until this chapter, uh, he has focused on Galilee and some of the, uh, Gal the uh, Gentile areas we've talked about, Sidon and Tyre and um, Caesarea Philippi, Decapolis. And he's using all this time. I think the reason he went in that direction was he's using the time to teach his disciples and to prepare them for the true nature of his mission. Uh, he's also trying to get them ready for his death. Uh, they don't understand, and we'll see that again this morning. In fact, uh, they just, they're al almost their hearts are hardened. They're not even listening to what he's saying. But I think he knows that eventually they will understand. I, it's interesting. I watched a, a movie last night that Ed Braswell had recommended to me called Risen. I actually bought the CD. It's about a tribune who is responsible for Christ's death on the cross. And uh, he is told to investigate by Pilate where the dead body is and who's responsible for spreading false rumors that it, that Christ is risen. <laughs> oh, Lord. <laughs> and um, it's interesting to listen to the disciples in a few scenes that are in the movies after his resurrection. And so I think Christ, uh, in the situations we've read so far, he is thinking about what they might think later. He's trying to tell them now, but they really don't understand. And so in these last six chapters of uh, Mark, uh, Christ and his disciples will be traveling to Jerusalem and will witness the things that take place in Jerusalem. Uh, they leave Capernaum, and if you look at your map, they leave Capernaum and my guess is they travel the red line that's on there called the Transjordan route. Uh, they come down through the mountainous territory of uh, Galilee, uh, heading into Samaria. Then they cross the Jordan and enter Perea. We said Perea was that area on the eastern side of the Jordan River that was under the uh, reign of uh, Herod Antipas. They go all the way down to the fording area near Jericho. They cross over to Jordan uh, and enter Jericho, which is where we'll leave them this morning, and then later travel the Jericho route to Jerusalem. And I have a really interesting video next week that I'm going to hopefully work into the lesson that talks about that road. It's, it's very, uh, very insightful, I think. Um, Luke 13 through 19 and Matthew 19 and 20 comes with the teaching of Jesus in this trip down there, mostly in Perea. And chapter 10 of Mark is uh, Christ in Perea until the very end when he gets to, uh, to Jericho. Meanwhile, the Pharisees seem to be following Jesus. Um, they monitor his moves, and my guess is the closer he gets to... Uh, to Jerusalem, the more worried they get because they they're not quite sure um, 
how the crowds will receive him, what kind of problems they'll have. Uh, will they? Will he be a threat to their authority and power as religious leaders? Oddly enough, the first thing they um, this chapter is a conversation between the Pharisees and Christ, but um, one of the first questions they ask him is about divorce. And you might ask, why in the world are they asking him about divorce? In the last couple of chapters, we talked about a particular notoriety of a person who suffered divorce. Anybody remember that story? What is? You remember um, Herod Antipas married his brother's wife, right? And who criticized him? John. John the Baptist. Yeah. And what happened to John? He was beheaded. imprisoned and then beheaded. So it doesn't surprise me that the Pharisees and the teachers of the law are questioning Jesus about divorce because if Christ says no you can't divorce they're hoping perhaps that Antipas will hear about that and arrest Jesus like he did Paul so I think that's the political motivation um, behind this whole story it's not a question of whether or not divorce is lawful because we're going to read the law. It's a question about what are the reasons for divorce. And um, there were two schools of thought. Um, one was from Rabbi Hillel, H-I-L-L-E-L. -L. There were two prominent Jewish rabbis at the time that had certain theological slants, okay? Uh, and his slant was that man, a man could divorce his wife for any reason. The school of Rabbi Shammai, S-H-A-M-M-A-I, said that the only reason a man should divorce his wife is on grounds of immorality. And um, if, if uh, and I'll and I'll just read this. Uh, you don't need to go there. Matthew 5, during the Sermon on the Mount, Christ mentions um, mentions divorce too, and this is what he says. It has been said, anyone who divorces his wife must give her a certificate of divorce. But I tell you that anyone who divorces his wife, except for marital unfaithfulness, causes her to become an adulteress, and anyone who marries a divorced woman commits adultery. So he, Jesus, speaks about the philosophy of Shammai, that school that says the only reason you can divorce a wife was for immorality. Now, when Christ gets his questions from the Pharisees, the first thing he does is ask them a question, which we'll get to. But his basic consent, his basic idea on marriage is that Divorce was an accommodation to human weakness and was used to bring an order to society that had disregarded God's will. So God's will was that marriage should be one time forever, but recognizing that um, man is not perfect in order to maintain order in society. Uh, divorce was granted by Mosaic Law, and we'll read that a little bit later. So Christ says that God's original intent for marriage was for a lifetime. And his no to divorce safeguards against human selfishness. And you can understand, I think, that, that humans being self-righteous and selfish, that's one of the principal and pro probably the basic reason why two people might, might divorce. Um, the, and you also have to understand when the original law was created. That was when uh, men made decisions and women were subject to their husband's will. And the other thing is, uh, science being what it was back then, everybody thought that man was the only 
person of the two that was responsible for procreation. The, the woman just bared the child, but it was the man that that was responsible. They didn't know about X and Y chromosomes and that sort of stuff. And so, because families descended from men, man to man, and property was divided up according to the sons, then divorce became, I guess, one of the ways you could make sure that you passed on inheritances. So if your wife didn't bear children, then you divorced her and you married somebody else. So let's, let's go into this and listen to what Christ says, and then I'll have some words to say about uh, what we can take from that. So I'm in Mark 10, and the first 12 chapters, and we're going to pause in the middle of this and go read the law. Jesus then left that place and went into the region of Judea across the Jordan. That's the map, right? He crosses over into Jordan probably, according to the map that we have uh, in Pella. Again, crowds of people came to him, and as was his custom, he taught them. Some Pharisees came and tested him by asking, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? So it's not a matter of is it lawful or not. It's a matter of what is the reason why a man would divorce his wife. What did Moses command you? There's the question. Jesus often responds to questions with a question. They said, Moses permitted a man to write a certificate of divorce and send her away. So let's go to that spot in Deuteronomy and see what Mosaic Law said. So chapter 4 in Deuteronomy says this, If a man marries a woman who becomes displeasing to him because he finds something indecent about her, and he writes her a certificate of divorce, gives it to her, and sends her from his house, and if after she leaves his house, she becomes the wife of another man, and her second husband dislikes her and writes her a certificate of divorce, there's got to be something wrong there, right? Um, gives it to her and sends her from his house, or if he dies, then her first husband, who divorced her, is not allowed to marry her again after she has been defiled. That would be detestable in the eyes of the Lord. Do not bring sin upon the land the Lord your God has given you as an inheritance. Okay, so Jewish rabbis at the time argued about what that really meant. Could a man divorce his wife for any reason, or did there have to be a reason for immorality? And, and of course, you can guess which one was the most popular. The one where you didn't have to have a reason. You just issued a uh, certificate of divorce. Um Interesting also that uh, the Bible really doesn't clarify any of this. If you read anywhere in the Bible where divorce is mentioned, uh, particularly in the Gospels, um, you'll not get a clear answer. So if you go look at any commentaries, um, they range from it's okay to not okay. And I guess... Uh, I think you lost me because when you started out, you said, what did... Jesus said, what did Moses say about it? But only for immortality, so it was clear. And now you're talking about there's I'm sorry, I just got lost. Well, we <laughs> Christians Christians don't abide by the Mosaic law. In other words, um, but really you don't Jesus you don't law, you don't kill somebody if if uh, they don't profess to be God, right? I mean the the law does not apply to Christians. I mean, if you read so any they think of, they're above it, huh? So you're saying they think they're above it? No, no, no. When Christ came, He abolished the law. Christ okay. came in place of the law. So, okay. because we believe in our sons of God through Christ, then we're no longer obligated to follow the Jewish okay. law. I'm with you now. Okay. okay. Thank you. So, but if you read the New Testament. There are lots of, not a lot, the statements that we have in the New Testament about divorce are not really clear. I mean, you could interpret them a lot of different ways. And so you can, you can go a lot of places and read commentary about divorce and marriage and get different. 
I mean, you know, the, the issue of men and women. I mean, that, that was before and has been an issue with um, the General Conference for a decade or more, whether or not marriage was between a man and a woman or whether what marriage was between two people. So there are a lot of interpretations. So here's my personal understanding. Mary, this is my understanding of marriage. <laughs> it's not a theology. It's mine. Okay, Marriage is a lifetime commitment. And it's intended to be so by God. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm divorced. Mm -hmm. am, am I eternally damned because I'm divorced? Mm -hmm. No. Divorce, like any other sin, is forgiven by God, if you ask him. Okay? So, yes, marriage is a lifetime commitment, and my first marriage did not last. There was no immorality. There was just a, an understanding that we couldn't get along anymore. And so two years after my divorce, I remarried. And I have asked God for forgiveness. And I don't think divorce and bad marriages are just like other things that are against God's intended will. And just like other things, if you sincerely ask for forgiveness, you will be forgiven. Uh, it's not surprising then that early on, divorce was an issue in the Methodist church, as it was with a lot of other churches, that pastors could not be divorced. So if you were divorced, you couldn't be a pastor. Or if you got divorced, you had to leave the, the clergy. Uh, and of course, that has changed, just like a lot of other things. Um, and in the past, marriage was between a man and a woman. And you may still believe that, and there's nothing wrong with that, but some people don't believe that, and in today's Methodist church, um, dependent upon the circumstances, pastors may or may not choose to marry two people of the same gender. Uh, pastors can now be homosexuals. So all of this... Uh, that latter statement really isn't, doesn't reflect what we've been talking about in divorce. But uh, I think Christ made it clear that God intended marriage to be a lifetime commitment. And uh, obviously, as human beings, uh, we fall far short of what God expects. And when we do, we just ask for forgiveness. Well, uh, first... Um, Marriage and then divorce and now children. That's logical, logical uh, sequence, I guess. Uh, yeah. Recall last uh, chapter's story. Uh, Jesus used um, children as an object in a lesson about um, don't try to be first. Remember, the disciples were talking about who's going to be first, and he said, you know, you need to be like children uh, and have the faith of children. And so Jewish parents would often take their children uh, to be blessed by the rabbi. And so it's not surprising that in this group of people that follow Christ around, there are families and children. And it wouldn't be surprising that parents and my images of mothers would bring their children to Christ for him to lay their hands on and, and to offer them a blessing. Um, so the disciples who are trying to manage Christ's workload obviously are trying to be considerate of his endurance and his stamina and the people that are around him. The problem is when the mothers bring their children, they get very discourteous. Uh, they admonish them. And uh, Christ gets upset that they have treated them that way. And so to make an object lesson of it, he welcomes the children, he grabs them, puts them on his lap. It's also, um, I think, part of the day that um, children were not considered to be, I guess, out of sight, out of mind. They, they were not treated with the love and care. And obviously parents love their children 
Uh, but in terms of society, children were not, I'll just say, respectable. They were not recognized as important um, individuals in, the, in a societal group. And so Jesus becomes pretty indignant when his disciples uh, treat the parents the way they did. And when he, when he gathers them around him, what he really does is he elevates the humanity and the dignity of children. So let's, let's go to uh, Mark 10, verse 13. And this, you often see a, a picture, a painting, uh, in my mind of Christ with children sitting on, on, on his knee. People were bringing little children to Jesus to have him touch them, but the disciples rebuked them. So that's what Christ is angry about. He, he doesn't like the way his disciples have treated them. When Jesus saw this, he was indignant. He said to them, Let the little children come to me, and do not hinder them, for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. How many does that phrase kind of ring very true, right? We've often heard that, at least I did. I tell you the truth, anyone who will not receive the kingdom of God like a child will never enter it. And he took the children in his arms, put his hands on them, and blessed them. Well, the next story is um, kind of interesting. Uh, it's one of the few stories in the Bible where somebody comes to Christ and leaves unhappy. <laughs> I mean, most of the stories we read, a blind man, a crippled man, um, people come to Christ, they're healed, and they go away happy. Um, I can't say that this is true. And you should give some thought as to why this person goes away sad uh, we need to con uh, we need some context to understand the story and in Jesus day um, Jews thought that great wealth was evidence of God's special blessing so if you were wealthy then you were considered to be blessed by God and of course there are a lot of examples of where that's not true and uh, it was probably perplexing to good Jews at the time. Anyhow, the man who comes to Christ uh, in this story, he was respected. He is respectful. Uh, he's not part of the Pharisees who are trying to trap Jesus. Um, if you uh, read the other Gospels, uh, Luke says he was a ruling officer, uh, perhaps a member of a council or a court. Matthew says he was young and um, Mark tells us he is wealthy. He's respectful. As we read this, you'll find that he falls on his knees before Christ as he asks this question. So this is not an entrapment sort of situation. This is a man who sincerely is seeking guidance from Christ. And we'll find out what his real problem is. He asks how to obtain eternal life. He wanted to know what he must do to earn the righteousness necessary to earn eternal life. Um, and Christ right away points him toward the Ten Commandments. As we read this, try to figure out which commandment he leaves out. When Christ mentions the commandments, the man says, I've done this all my life. So what's the problem? Um, by the way, uh, there is a reference in there to the man says, you are good to Christ, and Christ says, I'm not good, only God is good. Um, he, when Christ tells him that, he wants the man to have total reliance on God, um, <clears throat> where his real hope lies. So the young man had a specific view of the law. What he said was he measured obedience only by his external actions. What he lacked was love for God and self-sacrifice. He was looking for something he could do. And Jesus tells them he covets his wealth and that keeps him from trusting God. And then Jesus tells him to give away all his wealth. So when the man leaves, he goes away sad. Now, why does he go away sad? 
does he go away sad because he doesn't want to give up his wealth? Or does he go away sad because he intends to give up his wealth and he knows how hard it's going to be? We really don't know the answer to that, but it's a good question. You could probably do a sermon on it. Um, let's go to Mark 10, verse 17. So Jesus started on his way. A man ran up to him, a ruler, a young man, wealthy, and fell on his knees before, before him. Good teacher, he asks, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good? Jesus answered, no one is good except God alone. <coughs> you know the commandments. Do not murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not give false testimony, do not defraud, honor your father and mother. What did he forget? Anything jump out at you? Well, yes, yes. But in terms of his personal action, do not covet. Teacher, he declared, all these I have kept since I was a boy. I think it, I think Jesus intentionally didn't say, didn't say that one. Jesus looked at him and loved him. Why did he love him? Because he knew what he was going to say was going to upset him, right? And he, and he knew that because the man was sincere. He really was looking for an answer. This isn't one of those Pharisee, tell me something so I can trick you into it. One thing you lack, he said, Go sell everything you have and give it to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come and follow me. At this the man's face fell. He went away sad because he had great wealth. Again, it doesn't tell us why he was sad, whether he intended to give away and felt knew how difficult that was going to be or because he knew he couldn't give it away. Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, How hard is it for the rich to enter the kingdom of God? The disciples were amazed at his words. They were amazed at his words because then wealthy people were blessed by God. But Jesus, um, the disciples were amazed, and Jesus said, Children, how hard it, it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel, that's the biggest creature in Palestine, to go through the eye of a needle, the smallest thing that you could find. I heard Somebody say the eye of the needle referred to a gate in Jerusalem that camels couldn't get through. Then for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. See, that doesn't make sense to the disciples. Because if you were rich, then you were blessed by God, and obviously you would enter heaven. The disciples were even more amazed and said to one another, Well, who then can be saved? And Jesus looked at them and said, With man this is impossible, but not with God. All things are possible with God. So, um, a few things to ponder. Um, Jesus is not implying that um, anybody who has wealth must give away their wealth in order to be saved. Uh, if wealth or power or authority or any other blessing that a person might have keeps you from serving God and seeing God, then you should give it up. Uh, I don't know if we've had the lesson yet or I'm remembering what's about to happen. He said, you know, if your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out. If your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. He doesn't really mean that literally. What he means is if, if those things like wealth causes you to not truly love the Lord, then you should give it up. Well, Peter and the other disciples there, um, they really don't understand. Um, because salvation is really a gift of God. There's nothing we can do to earn it. Uh, and the reason why the man was concerned about is eternal life was because he did not really know God in his heart. And that's, that's what the whole point was. Any attempt on our part to earn our way into heaven is futile. And apart from the grace of God, nobody can be saved. So let's see what it says here. 
The disciples were even more amazed and said to one another, Who then can be saved? And Jesus looked at them. With man this is impossible, if not with God. All things are possible with God. Peter said to him, We have left everything to follow you. <laughs> so Peter is saying, You know, we've sacrificed everything. I tell you the truth, Jesus replied, no one who has left home or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or fields for me and the gospel will fail to receive a hundred times as much in this present age, homes, brothers, sisters, mothers, children, and fields, and with them persecution, and in the age to come eternal life. But many who are first will be last, and the last will be first. So yes. Um, you can imagine what the disciples have given up to follow Christ. And uh, there are a lot of things that we do in our modern day age to uh, have the right attitude toward uh, what God has promised. But the point is, this whole story is that uh, this man can't earn his way into heaven. And his problem was he didn't have God in his heart. And Christ said, well, the only way you can do that is to give up the things that are taking space in your heart and all your wealth. So Christ looks at his disciples now, and um, they are afraid. Uh, I suspect that there are the 12, and there are folks who are, I guess today's we call them groupies, <laughs> right, that follow certain entertainers, um, uh, they didn't have uh, TikTok and uh, all that sort of stuff, to, but it, it, it's the same idea. People that were following Christ and were amazed at what he did and uh, were not necessarily spiritually motivated, but uh, were receiving something from But Anyhow, they're on their way to Jerusalem. They've traveled down the road to Perea, and they're about to cross over the Jordan in Jericho. And um, based on Christ's earlier words and the constant testing of Jesus, they, they, can, they can see the animosity that the Pharisees are providing Christ. And as they get closer to the seat of religious power in Jerusalem, the people that are with him are becoming more and more concerned. You know, what's going to happen to him? What's going to happen to us? Some of them were probably thinking at the time, well, as soon as he gets there, he's going to declare himself king and he's going to turn and defeat Rome. Jesus plainly tells them that he's going to be arrested. He's going to be tortured. He's going to be spat on. He's going to be raised up on the cross and he's going to die. And he's going to raise three days later. I I, I can just picture him talking to the disciples and all they're hearing is all this front stuff and they they completely miss this last thing that he's going to be raised after three days and maybe they hear it but they you know they really don't believe it they, they don't understand what's going to happen um, they they really don't understand it in fact they become uh, almost uh, <clears throat> antagonistic toward this whole idea. So let's go uh, um, Mark 10 verse 32. They were on their way up to Jerusalem with Jesus leading the way and the disciples were astonished while those who followed were afraid. They knew where they were headed. They knew the animosity that the Pharisees had showed Christ. They knew the way Christ spoke against the, some of the ideas and the theologies at the time. And so they're concerned. Um, again, he took the twelve aside and he told them what was going to happen to him. We're going up to Jerusalem, he said, and the Son of Man will be betrayed to the chief priests and teachers of the law. They will condemn him to death, will hand him over to the Gentiles, who will mock him, spit on him, flog him, and kill him, and three days later he will rise. So that's the scenario that Christ has presented. Now, it's dumbfounding to me that right after Christ says this, um, James and John create a lot of angst among the twelve by asking Jesus for positions of power and authority. 
So Christ says, I'm going to Jerusalem. I'm going to die. And James and John say to Christ, well, can we fit in on your reign? <laughs> can we be uh, the XO and the chief of staff? Um, if you think about it, they really didn't know what they were asking. Uh, Jesus knows when they ask this question that they're going to suffer horribly for their faith. They don't know it yet, but Christ knows it. And uh, Christ's words to them ends with what I would call Mark's theme in his gospel. That Jesus came to the world to be a servant who would suffer and die for our salvation. And Christ's life would be a ransom. You know, a ransom is what you pay, uh, right? We think of kidnapping. Give me a ransom. Well, I guess you can consider us being kidnapped by sin. And uh, Christ's death paid the ransom to release us from our bondage. So let's uh, read what these disciples are thinking. Verse 35. Then James and John, the sons of Zebedee, remember these were the closest disciples, right? And maybe they thought because they were had witnessed the transfiguration and uh, had been part of that uh, visit to Jairus' daughter's um, death scene, they thought they were special. Teachers, they said, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. <laughs> That's kind of an open-ended question. So what do you want me to do for you, he asked, and Christ probably already knows. They replied, let one of us sit at your right hand and the other at your left in your glory. Now, they don't mean heavenly glory. They mean earthly glory. You know, uh, you don't know what you're asking, Jesus said. Can you drink the cup I drink or be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with? Meaning, uh, are you going to suffer on the cross like me? Are you going to... Uh, be tortured and uh, arrested like me? We can, they answered. And we know what happened, right? They all disappeared and hid. Jesus said to them, You will drink the cup I drink and be baptized with the baptism, I, baptism I'm baptized with, but to sit at my right or left is not for me to grant. These places belong to those for whom it has been prepared. Now, when the word gets out to the other 12 and the other 10 they get wouldn't you be upset when the 10 heard about this they became indignant with James and John Jesus called them together and said so he's got <laughs> he's got a mutiny on his hands you've got to set it straight you know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them and their high officials exercise authority over them not so with you instead whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant and whoever wants to be first must be slave of all and here you can underline this verse in your bible for even the son of man did not come to be served but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many that's mark's theme and it comes right before he goes uh into jerusalem next sunday uh when we finally get there it's uh it's Palm Sunday, and the rest of Mark and chapters 11 through 16 are really um, the Passion Week and uh, uh, after the resurrection. So before uh, they march on to Jerusalem, they're in um, Jericho. So they cross the Jordan uh, uh, from Perea, and they enter Jericho, and having... Um, now in Jericho, Jerusalem is just 15 miles away. That's, that's really uh, about an eight-hour walk. And while they're there, a blind beggar named Bartimaeus is sitting alongside the road that Jesus is taking. And he hears the name Jesus of Nazareth. This is interesting. And he, he's blind, but he sees something that the crowd around Christ don't. He calls out to Jesus, and he calls him the son of David. What does that mean? He recognizes Christ as the Messiah. When he calls him the son of David, that's what he means. Many of the people who are following Christ are there not for spiritual reason, but 
to receive the blessings or healing that Christ may have. So the crowd physically can see, but spiritually they can't. Bartimaeus, who physically can't see, spiritually sees what's happening around him. And so, uh, verse 46. Then they came to Jericho. As Jesus and his disciples, together with a large crowd, were leaving the city, a blind man, Bartimaeus, that is, the son of Timaeus, was sitting by the roadside begging. When he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to shout, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Many rebuked him and told him to be quiet, but he shouted all the more. <laughs> Who's becoming a pain in the tail, right? Um, son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stopped and said, call him. So they called to the blind man, cheer up on your feet. He's calling you. Throwing his cloak aside, he jumped to his feet and came to Jesus. What do you want me to do for you? Jesus asked him. The blind man said, Rabbi, I want to see. Go, said Jesus, your faith has healed you. He recognized his faith when he called him son of David. Immediately he received the sight and followed Jesus along the road. One, one note here up at the top where it says... Um, the crowd were leaving the city, were leaving Jericho. Um, one of the other gospels says, as Jesus was entering Jericho. This um, movie, I'll, the short video I'm going to show next week, explains what that, that dichotomy. So just keep that in mind. So when, uh, when the narrator explains why one would say leaving the city and the other entering the city, you might get an explanation for it. So what can we conclude about today's lessons? First of all, um, Jesus is headed to Jerusalem where he uh, will be celebrated like a king. Uh, Palm Sunday. He does everything to meet the expectation of the Messiah as prophesied in the Old Testament. The crowd fails to realize that Jesus is not a political Messiah. He is not going to establish a physical kingdom on earth and defeat the Romans. He's truly a Messiah who came to heaven, came from heaven to seek and save the world. He's not going to be an authoritative king. He's going to be a servant, just like John left us with that one uh, one verse a um, couple of questions that uh, Christ entertained uh, Jesus says marriage is permanent and he says that um, a man faithful only to the commandments and doesn't have God in his heart um, will be unhappy um, so what can we conclude about the God that we profess to love um First of all, uh, I think the fact that we're seeing Christ walk on earth and interchange with people about all these questions that have come before him and all the people who come to him for help, uh, I think we have to conclude that God understands us and is aware of our humanity and our failings. Uh, Jesus walked in our shoes. If one of the reasons why Jesus came to earth was so that people could actually see what God was like. Um, you can read all about um, an entertainer or a, a relative or an individual, and, but until you meet them, you really don't know what they're like. And so we really wouldn't know what God was really like without having uh, Christ as an example. I think God is a God of second chances. He's always there to help us uh, remake our circumstances through redemption and grace and uh, reversal. Uh, you know, we're, we're human. We get divorced. We have fights with our kids. We have um, difficulties with people at work. Um, but God shows us that he is a God that 
forgives and that we should be offering grace in our own lives the way grace is offered to us. And I, and I agree with Mark's uh, statement about being a servant. Serve others and happy in God like a child. Why is that a good example? Um, our children love us because we're parents, right? We have no legal obligation over them. There is one, but they don't recognize that. Um, we can be uh, from poor families or wealthy families, but children have faith in their parents because they're our parents. And it's just an innocent, sincere faith. And that's really what Christ was trying to tell us. We need that same kind of innocent, sincere faith in God that we just count on him because he is God. He is our father in the same way our earthly father, uh, we believe in him. Let's uh, bow our heads. Father God, help us to uh, remember Christ's words to his disciples and to those around him. Help us to be servants to others, to... Uh, serve people help us to have faith in you and help us to recognize that uh, as Christ walked the earth we recognize what the true nature of you are and what you everything is possible uh, even the salvation of our souls in thy name we pray Amen, Amen.